Ski Institute colleagues, students, friends, and visitors. It is a fantastic pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, ski lecturer, Prabhaka Raghavan. Prabhaka is Vice President for Strategic Technologies at Google. I cannot resist already here <laughs> and not to our students. Visiting the student cluster outside my office this morning, Prabhakar mentioned that our student cluster space is more impressive than the space that he shares with his colleagues at Google Management. We tell that to our students all the time. And it is now gratifying to have a visitor of the stature of Prabhakar tell them that too. And no, we did not ask him to say that. Prabhakar in his career and work epitomizes modern research and technology. With a Bachelor of Technology from the Indian Institute of Technology at Madras, Prabhakar moved to Silicon Valley where he got a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley. And he worked on hardware semiconductor engineering research to start with before moving on to software research. And before joining Google, Prabhakar also worked at IBM Research, Verity, and Yahoo, where he was the director of research. It looks like getting Prabhakar involved is the tipping point of a technology company. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhakar's research, more or less in his words, is at the interface of computer science and the social sciences. He authored very many research papers as well as two books, which have been cited tens, very possibly hundreds of thousands of times. It's difficult, you see, to get a better estimate because Prabhakar does not have a Google Scholar page. <laughs> These popular books and research papers are on algorithms, optimization, web search, and data mining. For his research, Prabhakar won many awards and citations, starting with the Student Best Paper Award, which even features on his Wikipedia page. And I'm sure there is another note here to our students. Is now a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the ACM and IEEE. In 2009, he was awarded an honorary degree from the University of Bologna. Prabhakar keeps on researching and searching, not only the web and not only at Google, but it seems he is searching our collective scientific soul. And now, this led him to argue for the need of an emergent academic discipline of computational social sciences. So please help me welcome Prabhakar to the Ski Institute. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Orly. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Uh, that was a very charitable introduction. And uh, I do think that if you come to my floor where I work at Google, the density of people sitting is more than that in this room. Uh, so that's what uh, we meant by you have really nice uh, uh, student space. All right, so what I'm going to argue for today is a thesis that uh, computer scientists, as we are trained in the tools of mathematics and logic, uh, need to increasingly shift our focus to understanding consumer behavior. And obviously, uh, we've gone in 50 years, roughly, from predicting a worldwide market for six computers, which uh, is misattributed to uh, Tom Watson, the founder of IBM. It's actually Howard Aiken of Harvard, who apparently said that. Um, and, and so that's really what I'll be talking about uh, today. So to, to this end, I'm going to begin with a simple warm-up exercise. This is something I teach students in my graduate class uh, at Stanford. Uh, so three or four slides. And I'm going to talk about uh, a simple example where the design of an algorithm and system depended actually on our understanding of people's behavior. So the artifact we're going to talk about is something called a connectivity server, which is a beast that gives us in-memory support for fast queries on adjacencies on graphs. Okay, and the particular graph you're really interested in is the web graph, which is has a page, a node for every web page, and uh, a URL is a directed link. So you want to answer queries like which URLs uh, point to a given URL or are pointed to by a given given URL, and this has lots of applications in in the web industry. So the basic object that we're interested in is something called an adjacency list. So each URL we codify it with an integer. Uh, let's just pretend for this running example that we have 4 billion web pages. In, in practice, the number is far bigger than that. But 4 billion lets me say 32 bits per node. Okay. 
so naively, to write down each edge, you write down the two endpoints, that's 64 bits. Okay? I'm going to show you a scheme that does dramatically better, that does about three bits per edge on average to encode the web graph in a manner that supports fast adjacency queries. Okay? And in fact, uh, some work by people at Microsoft Research has got this down to two bits per edge, and I won't be talking about that. So you can see the degree of compaction that goes on here. You're going from 64 bits down to about two bits. Okay? And, and I'll argue that this actually hinges on, under, on an understanding of how people create web pages. Okay, so what we're going to do, of course, is not take any edge and write it down with two bits. We're going to take a list of edges, an adjacency list, and compress it so that on average it amortizes down to something like this. Okay, so what are the properties we exploit in this compression, right? Uh, these are all the things you'd mostly imagine. Okay? So many lists are similar, and it's the similarity that arises from human behavior. There's locality, just like you have locality of reference in memory, uh, many links from a page go to so-called nearby pages, and you'll see nearby in what sense in a moment, right? And then there's a lot of coding theory that goes on, which I won't describe here, but do you understand that uh, in any of these situations, if I told you the kinds of distributions of integers that arise, you can be very, very clever from an information theoretic sense about squeezing those last bits down. I'm really going to focus on these first two things, okay? All right. So, so what does it mean when I say locality? Right? So here's a nice ordering of all the URLs in the world. So I'm going to start with all the URLs and just order them lexicographically from top to bottom. Nothing clever. Okay? So the first URL is going to be aa.com or whatever. And then at the very bottom, you have z whatever. Right? And in between, you might have a subsequence that looks like this because these are several departments of Stanford. Okay? There really isn't an alchemy department, I assure you. Okay. So what's the basic idea here, right? And this sort of starts to tell you why things work out, okay? Each URL has an adjacency list. We've written it down with an integer, okay? And due to the way we behave in creating web pages, the way we expect consumers to consume web content, there's a great degree of templating that's around the web, okay? The adjacency of list of a, any URL is very similar it turns out to one of the seven preceding lists. Now, seven is sort of an arbitrary number I've made up. You'll see why seven in a second, right? All I'm saying here is, as you run down through these URLs and their adjacency lists, you can typically express the adjacency list of a URL in terms of one of the recent ones. That's the main thesis, okay? That's because of templating, right? So when the Stanford webmaster creates a web page, they have a copyright page, they have policies page, they have whatever, right? Terms of use and so on. Um, all of you, the faculty here, point to the SKI homepage, maybe the CS homepage, and so there's a great deal of repetition and templating, and that's what's going to get exploited. And that's partly because consumers, when they navigate this content, expect to have all of these links around. This is sort of the mindset that the web has implicitly imposed on us, okay? So the key idea is to express your adjacency list that you're trying to write down in terms of one of the recent preceding ones. These ideas that I'm talking about are due to Paolo Boldi and Sebastian Ovinia of Milan. Okay. So let me give you a very simple example. Consider these adjacency lists. So let's say this is the alchemy department, biology, chemistry, et cetera, and then you come to this one. I want to say that this is very much like one of the recent lists. In fact, the way I'm going to encode that blue list is to say it's the same as the list two higher up, minus two. Just remove the nine and throw in an eight. So now you see I've written down this whole adjacency list in a very compact form, and all of this can be done symbolically very compactly, right? So with this, uh, uh, now one other thing, right? Why did I say seven? Well, I claim it can be 15 or 31 or something like that. Why do I need? Because I need to point back how far in the history I'm willing to look at. I need a few bits to write down. Why seven and not eight? Because every now and then, you're not going to have find anybody in recent history to mimic. So you have to start from scratch. So you keep a special code word for that, right? So, so that's all there is to this, right? All right. So in the simple warm-up exercise, right, it all hinged on the similarity and locality in a canonical ordering, in this case, lexicographic order, it works thanks to the behavior of users and content creators in the web, okay? Uh, the piece of the puzzle that I still have to convince you of 
is we started to build out a connectivity server. So these adjacency queries can, in fact, be answered efficiently using the structure I just built up. Why? Because you queue into a URL. And while well, you don't really have its list of neighbors, what you have is a pointer that says, look too higher and make these changes. You look too higher. Maybe you don't have a full list there either. It says, look three higher and make some more changes. And you keep going back. In practice, you go very few times, and then you're done, typically. So this does support fast adjacency queries with enormous compression. That gives you, okay? And this is an easy to implement one pass algorithm. Okay? OK, so that was the warm up. In the next little bit, I'm going to go through three themes um, on how consumer behavior is changing what we compute and how we should be thinking about these things. Right? And the three themes, I, the, I call them subject, subjective functions. I'll talk a little bit about fat tail distributions and why these are recurrent in consumer behavior. And then I'll talk about parallelism a little bit and the paradigms we start to use and how there again, in the design of parallel algorithms, we do have to think about the distributions of data that arise in consumer behavior. Okay? All right. So what do I mean by subjective functions? I, I think of this in contrast to objective functions that we are used to in operations research and pretty much any branch of optimization. Right? So as consumers drive most of our applications, right, uh, it is still true if you go and catalog all the operations that computers spend their time on. There's lots of sorting and selecting. But I would argue that a growing chunk of cycles go into something that's vaguely the notion of making a user happy. Okay? And I'll give you a few examples in a moment. Right? The, the trouble with making users happy is very hard to write down the happiness objective function. Okay? Um, and in fact, you don't have one. You have 7 billion of them. right? And so you won't even try uh, writing them down. So what we end up doing, and I'll give you several concrete examples, is we find and optimize proxies for these objective functions, what I call sub subjective functions. Okay? So, so here's a prototypical subjective function. What's a good ranking? Okay, so you come, you type search results. People give you a ranked results. Results, Google does, Bing, Baidu, Yandex. Okay? Um, but how do you determine that something is the optimal ranking or the best ranking possible, right? Uh, and so here's the technology as of about 40 years ago, right? This is, these are ideas due to Jerry Saltam at Cornell. What he said was you take each document you have, turn it into a bag of words, make it a vector of words, okay? In a vector space that spans all the terms in your language, okay? And you do the same for each query. So your query might be, also, is also a vector, but maybe it has only two non-zero elements, which are the two keywords you typed. Okay? And then the score is the dot product of the query and document vectors. And algorithmically, your task is to find the 10 or 100 best dot products. Okay? Now, notice that this dot product isn't in any absolute truth. It's a proxy for what the user will find happy. Okay? So this is a proxy for user happiness as of about 40 years ago. And this is the precursor to the modern search industry. Okay? Um, here are a few other examples of subjective function, right? Find me beautiful pictures of sunsets. I mean, people can come and post queries like these on Facebook or Google or whatever. Um, you've got a database of images. You don't even know what's a sunset. It's certainly hard to quantify what's beautiful, right? How do you come up with good answers for these things, right? Um, if I give you six cameras at a stadium, find me the best view at every point in time continually, right? Of course, you have, today you have seasoned operators figuring these things out, right? But how can you? find these things. And there's some subjectivity to this, right? Show me songs I like, Spotify or whoever, right? Um, spelling correction is one that I've said in brackets, because this was one of the few we can actually quantify very precisely as a maximum likelihood estimate. Okay? So here are some characteristics of subjective functions, right? So how do we tell we're doing OK? How do we tell you if you're showing you the songs you want to hear? If you're giving your search ranking, that's good. If you're showing you beautiful pictures, right? Well, the obvious answer is to ask the users of your system. But what does this even mean? You don't have the bandwidth to go and ask 7 billion people, right? Here's a different characteristic of these subjective functions. Right? And this is underappreciated, but I'll point it out. Users do have some tolerance for junk. It's not like we want to push junk at you mostly, right? But if you occasionally slip up, it's not the end of the world. It's not like a flight control system for a plane or a nuclear power, you know, reactor control system or an enterprise transactional database where when you run a query, a payroll query, it better be right because you have to be paid the right amount, right? Uh, so, so there is some tolerance for error. What you find in this business is not that you never make a mistake, but 
try not to do it too often. And when you do it, not be too egregious. Okay? Here's yet another characteristic. We're used to thinking in terms of computational complexity and saying, okay, if a traveling salesman is hard, sorting is easy, et cetera. But these are problems where typically these fuzzy consumer-oriented subjective functions, having infinite computing doesn't necessarily help, right? So yes, we burn a lot of cycles at web companies like Google and Facebook and so on. But if you gave us 10 times as much computing budget, we wouldn't know how to give you 10 times better answers. In other words, to a first order, we are not constrained by computational constraints, okay? or even a second order. Right? And, and so these are some ways in which I think these consumer-centric subjective functions are different from the traditional computational problems we're used to studying, okay? and the problems that we teach students with. Right? Um, I'll come back to this in a moment. Right? Okay. So the first 25 years of search ranking following the seminal work of Jerry Salton was essentially at stretching and compressing and squeezing the axes of this vector space using clever methods, okay? So, um, and, and there was a presumption that the people seeking information from a search engine weren't ordinary consumers like, well, I don't think anybody in this room can be called an ordinary consumer, but you know, they're there out there, believe me, right? So, uh, but there are somehow these experts, information scientists. In fact, the early benchmarks, the National Institute of Standards Technology set up had as experts former CIA officers who would be doing the queries, right, to judge systems. So in that sense, um, these are not ordinary consumers early on. But starting about the mid-90s, we had had Alta Vista, we were starting to have InfoSeq and so on. There's a sea change. And you had this whole lot of ordinary consumers who suddenly could access the web, and the expectations dramatically shot up. You didn't, didn't, as you did in the world of Salton, describe your information need using a paragraph you typed in two keywords and expected magic. Okay. Uh, there's also, in an open ecosystem like the web, there's adversarial content. People coming in saying, I want to promote my commercial content right, at consumers because there's money involved. Right? Suddenly, it's no longer some sort of purely academic study of what is good and bad. Uh, I won't say much about this in this talk, but these are all characteristics that changed uh, the ranking. So, so how, do, how does it get done today? And, without getting into all the detail, right? Um, suppose you have a student, you're a professor here, your student comes to you and says, I have a new way of scoring documents, and I call it page rank. Uh, this is a true story, actually. Uh, I remember this from more than 15 years ago. Right? And, and so Larry Page, who was a student at Stanford, came and said, I have a new way, and we all said, yeah, okay, Altoist already works, right? Um, but you could ask a technical question, okay, Salton, propounded as dot products, you have page rank or whatever your favorite rank is. How do you start to combine these? Okay? And, and this is sort of what lies at the, at the core of modern uh, search ranking. Okay? What you do is you collect a bunch of user judgments. So you take a whole bunch of benchmark queries and you get trained users to give rate query answers on these queries. Okay? Um, these are you could use trained raters. You could use Mechanical Turk or something like that. You could just watch what people click on the web, right? In any case, you have some notion of a ground truth of what is good and bad. And you have a modest size of this, right? What you're doing is tweaking the combination, in this case of page rank and dot product, so that you, you're essentially solving a regression problem. Okay? So you say it's A times page rank plus B times cosine. Pick A and B to optimize this regression, minimize the error function. Okay. And that's pretty much the methodology that is widely used in the search engine industry. Okay. To come up, you start with a benchmark of golden set data and you regress to it using these two, or if you want, 500 other factors that could make a difference. Okay. You could say somebody comes along with an in, uh, intuition that says, Pages that have lots of block capitals and exclamation marks are probably bad pages. Okay? You don't have to figure out exactly how to monkey with that. You throw it into this machine learning system, and it comes back and maybe gives that a zero weight or a low weight. Okay? All right, so what have we seen here? Right? Um, the world is full of signals for good search ranking, or for that matter, to find beautiful pictures, you know, likable songs, memorable slogans. Uh, if about a year ago, John Kleinberg had this nice paper at uh, the World Wide Web Conference where he was trying to pull out slogans from published media 
that would turn out to be memorable in election campaigns, okay? And you can actually do this mechanically very, very well, okay? Certain juxtapositions of words uh, and parts of speech will actually do a good job of this, okay? Now, here's a key punchline, right? Combining all these signals is left to machine learning, okay? For the most part. Now, you can have humans come in and add some intuition, but at their core, these become large math programs, which are things we know how to solve, okay? All right, so, the process of improving a search ranking or an algorithm for finding beautiful pictures, whatever, entails two pieces, really, right? One is inventing new signals, features in the machine learning algorithm, and then increasing the, the volume of training data because you know, tastes keep changing, uh, the data out there keeps changing, to train this machine learning kernel. Okay? And this leads to a very interesting upshot, right? So we are starting to learn functions we can barely write down, we can barely cleanly describe these, right? It's all implicit in some ground truth of what makes users happy. I cannot write down what users' happiness is. 40 years ago, Salton thought users' happiness could be captured by a dot product. Now we don't even pretend for anything of that, right? Um, but we still do a pretty darn good job of solving many of these problems without writing these things down, right? So we can approximate user happiness okay, and iteratively improve on it. And this has started to become a standard methodology in both research and industry. Data volume is huge. And, and here's something that, you know, when it first hit me, it made me kind of sad because I was trained in the design of algorithms. Right? So what do we do today in universities like this and elsewhere? We bring students into the algorithm design class. We teach them and say, well, first try divide and conquer. And if that doesn't work, well, go try this other thing called dynamic programming. If that doesn't work, you know, make a math program out of it. Hopefully it's a linear program. And, Hopefully things work out to integers, right? Um, all good, but I would argue that if you just look at the measure of algorithms being designed today and written into code in the industry, the vast majority of them have, have been written by machine learning algorithms. They're not written by humans. Okay. In other words, what we've been teaching students in class is all good foundation, but out there in practice, a lot of algorithms are written by machine learning kernels. The other ones who figured out how to combine these signals and that, well, these decision trees, whatever it is, right? And, and so these machines are putting people like me out of business in some sense, right? Uh, and, and this is sort of a, a very, uh, when it first hit me, it was a very interesting point. So I sort of changed my tone after that. And these days when I talk to faculty, chairs, deans, you know, uh, I. I do think that every undergraduate should go out with some decent understanding of machine learning. Okay? And that's just the reality. There's too many problems out there for us to write everything down as a succinct objective function and run you know, some sort of optimization. Right? Um, and we are abdicating algorithm design to these learning kernels. Okay? Uh, and that was something of a profound uh, revelation to me. Okay? Although when I state it thus, it seems obvious. Okay? All right, let me switch to my second theme. Uh, which is a segment on consumer behavior called fat tails. Okay? So this is a graphic from Wired magazine in 2004 when Chris Anderson, who was then the editor, uh, postulated the notion of a long tail. What did he say? He said, well, first of all, I don't like the name of the long tail. I'll explain why in a moment. But he basically said that online businesses like Amazon and um, others, where uh, Netflix, were winning because they could manage to carry lots of inventory that a brick and mortar store couldn't, right? So you could build a store that could hold 40,000 books, and you now that's your Barnes and Noble. Uh, but there's lots of mass out here that consumers want. And, and his thesis was it's in pursuit of this that people are going online, okay? Um, so, so here's sort of uh, the, the thesis he was putting forward. That the vast majority of products, these could be books, movies, mo most things that you consume, videos. Okay, that's going to be a little hard for people in the back. Um, the vast majority of products, uh, can you see there? Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> Our messes, they're not hits, okay? Not too many people want them, right? Uh, if you take the expectation over all queries of the number of times a query is asked, the answer is in the single digits. Okay, so most queries are asked like two or three times. Okay, same phenomenon. Right? But these worst sellers in aggregate accumulate a lot of revenue volume, right? So they're still important. You cannot say 
I will build a bookstore that doesn't deal with anything but the New York Times bestseller list. You cannot build a search engine that says, I'll answer the top 20% of queries. If you want to do the rest, go someplace else, right? Let's look at this in a little more detail, okay? So, so these are just some numbers. So a lot of revenue from Netflix, Amazon, et cetera, are reportedly for things not available in traditional stores. But it does beg the question, what is the underlying consumer behavior that we really should focus on, right? How many people care about the tail, right? Could it be that, uh, so, so let me detail this in a second, right? So could the world, for instance, be bimodal in the following sense, right? So here are two views of human behavior consistent with heavy tails, okay? And I call it heavy tails because it's really, <laughs> right? The tail has to be heavy, it has a lot of mass, not that it's long because the Gaussian uh, distribution has a long tail. Okay. So could it be that the world consists of two kinds of people? Uh, there are the normal people who consume you know, uh, ma mainstream network television and um, people magazine and, and only the, you know, the hit movies. And then there's the swath of people who consumes the tail of interest, you know, the Bergman movies, the eclectic books, and so on. Okay. Or could it be that the, the world is different? Whoops. And one of the things we found is from looking at a lot of data sets, uh, movies, books, uh, queries, et cetera, is that we in fact have a homogenous population. We're all part, uh, partially eclectic, meaning that everybody spends a bunch of time here, but occasionally makes a foray into the tail. Okay? So that means you cannot build a store or a search engine that only caters to the head, okay? because then in the process you're going to lose everybody. Okay? So if you think of Consumers as people who, when they go here, don't find you offering what you, they're looking for and disappear. Okay. That economic model suggests that it's not viable to fail to service the tail. Okay. So that's the first insight. Now let's look at this uh, a little bit deeper. One of the things that uh, people have probably heard about a lot is the so-called power law, right? So, so let me uh, dwell on that for a second. If you look at, take a random web page and ask how many links go into it, and do it in a log-log scale, you get straight lines, okay? Uh, ignore for the moment there are two curves here, right? In fact, it's very predictably something like this. Right? You, you get the same kind of phenomenon with different slopes. If you ask things like popularity of books, movies, et cetera, you get this power law behavior. You don't get any sort of Poisson distribution or Gaussian distribution, okay? Uh, those of you who worked in natural language processing have heard of something called Zipf law, which says that the distribution of use of words in natural language is something like one over i. Okay? So you get these behaviors that don't go down exponentially in i, but really polynomially in i. And this is a very recurring phenomenon. Okay? So, and these distributions, these power law distributions, correspond to the fat tails we've been observing, whether it's product popularities, movie popularities, whatever. Right? So you're looking at these probability distributions over positive integers. Okay? So search query frequencies and decrease in order. And, and the thing that happens is you pick any bucket out there and then look beyond. That tail is a pretty big chunk, which is, again, the, the heavy tail effect. Okay? The interesting thing is this seems to appear recurrently in human behavior. If you look at the distribution of populations of cities, okay, you again get this heavy tail. Okay? Uh, you look at the number of friends a person has, that too has this. All right. So, so here's the, the so-called power law. The log log plot is a straight line, okay? and it's a heavy tail distribution. Okay? Uh, there are other distributions that behave qualitatively similarly. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this, there's a fascinating survey by Michael Mitzenmacher of Harvard, who traces these, the study of these distributions back to the mid-19th uh, mid century. Okay? So these were formal objects of study even back then. Uh, even uh, roughly, you should think of it as people had known about the central limit theory, uh, theorem for 200 years, right? And people started getting interested in these distributions. Distributions of incomes, okay? Uh, it, like I said, it's a misnomer to call it a long tail distribution. It's really the heaviness of the tail that matters, okay? All right, how do you start to, what human behavior might support such behavior, right? You got a little bit of a hint when I talked about the things that a web page points to, that what a web page points to is similar to some near, what a nearby page points to. Okay. And this is actually a fairly general phenomenon. And, and before I give away the punchline, right, uh, 
Uh, I know many people, many of you will deny this, but let's say you're writing a paper, it's the conference deadline is upon you and you still haven't written the references, so you have to hurriedly write the references. So you put in a paper or two, and then you say, well, you know what, let me take the paper I just cited, take their citations and cut and paste, right? Uh, it does a pretty good job, okay? Um, that is going to give you a power law, and here's why. Okay? So, uh, so let's say each web page is a node and each hyperlink is a directed edge as always, okay? And edges are added to this graph in sequence, and there's a fixed parameter alpha between zero and one, which is the probability with which you link to a random page, you cite a random paper, okay? You buy a random product, you go to a random movie, okay? With the rest of the probability, you copy somebody else's behavior. Okay, that's it. Okay? So if when humans exhibit copying behavior, you get power loss. Okay? This is a very simple explanation, it turns out. Okay? Um, on news sites, it turns out that some of the time they show you a random story to do a bit of exploration to see if people are interested in this. A lot of the time they show you a previous story in proportion to its popularity. That gives rise to such distributions in the popularity of news consumed. Okay, now if you actually want to analyze this, I'm not going to walk through the math of this, but you can write down a simple, simple difference equation that, that exactly follows what I said in the previous page. Roughly what it's saying is that if at a certain time step, you're looking at how many uh, movies have been watched J times, well, at the next time step, with some probability, somebody, a movie that's been watched J minus one times gets promoted, you lose some that got what j times went to j plus one, you take the rest of the behavior, okay? And the solution to this difference equation turns out to be what you want it to be, okay? It's a power law. It's a limiting distribution. To prove that takes a martingale argument, we're not going to go anywhere there, okay? But here's a consequence. When we do the analysis of algorithms, when we do the analysis of queuing systems, uh, often we assume you have these three little letters called IID, okay? It's, Deceptive. What's deceptive about it is IID processes give rise to sharply concentrated Poisson-like distributions. Okay. The behavior you're seeing here is not IID. I'm not acting independent of people before me. I'm actually watching what they did and mimicking what they did. Okay. So these consumer phenomena over and over again, because of copying behavior. Okay. Now, I, I say because, uh, I have to be uh, watchful because that's a dangerous thing to say. I cannot attribute the observation of heavy tails entirely to, to copying behavior. Copying behavior is a plausible explanation, okay? It's, it's uh, I cannot assert causality here, right? Uh, probably take 50 years of, the next 50 years of sociology to even resolve that, okay? All right, now, here's the point I want to make from a mathematics and computer science standpoint, right? Most of the analysis we do in computer science uses these simple IID uh, events. What if we took all of this analysis of data structures and algorithms because we need to for building computer systems that face consumers, okay, and analyze them under these heavy tail probability distributions, okay? And we've done some early work on this. For instance, we can look at the sizes of certain indexes, like search indexes, when you have this kind of behavior, okay? Um, so, that still is early, right? We need to do much better modeling and analysis, as I said, Simply attributing heavy tails to copying is, is far too simplistic. We really have to get to the underlying individual and social behaviors, right? To assert that when you write a paper, the citations come from this simple process is far too simplistic, right? It probably has to do with various forms of hierarchical behavior, and uh, I won't get into that more now. All right, um, it's also the case that consumer behavior is not only correlated to other people, but to various forms of marketing, market forces. So for instance, you go to Amazon, you're buying something, and it says people like you also purchased this or looked at this item, right? How does that influence the choices you make? How does that change the distribution of products that pay, right? And if you've turned that back from, a, from if you're running an Amazon or a Walmart or whatever, how should we shard the data of the product database across, across different machines and data centers, right? Because all of that, is consequential here. Okay. Uh, it's also clear that it's, here's a popular theory out there, right? So you all know about viral cat videos on YouTube or whatever, right? So, so a meme just spreads out there. And there's this belief that somehow something went viral, okay? What's very hard to 
confirm or deny in these situations is, well, was it really because the cat video went, went intrinsically viral and there was, you know, people spent time looking at machine learning features to say what are the features common to things that go viral? Or is it because the home page of Yahoo, the front page of New York Times promoted that video and had a story, right? And one of the difficulties, big difficulties, is this laboratory of human society is not within your control. You cannot say, well, let me run a control group that doesn't see the New York Times and a treatment group that does see the New York Times, right? Randomized experiments are very hard to do. Longitudinal experiments are very, very hard to do, right? Watching people over time because people's behavior does change over time. Right? Somebody is a teenager today, you know, 10 years later, they're an assistant professor or whatever, right? Uh, you cannot hold their behavior fixed, okay? So what distributions, what statistical characteristics arise from consumers subject to these forces, okay? Um, some of you may have seen this phrase, the filter bubble, that asserts that thanks to Google and Amazon and uh, other large internet companies, all of a sudden, uh, we are getting focused in on a small set of stories or web pages that uh, uh, we see because these are the ones that pop up high in search results or Amazon queries or whatever. We don't in the data see any evidence of this sort. And in some sense, I'm not sure what the right benchmark here is, right? Uh, is it okay to have a filter bubble that's created by editors at mass media but not at you know, a commercial search engine? Hard to tell, right? So, so these are huge questions of major societal impact, and I'll come back to them later. Uh, the, the last vignette I'm going to talk about is about parallelism and how it's changed. Um, some of you who are roughly of my vintage will remember a time when uh, we started studying parallelism and thought about these ideal parallel machines called parallel random access machines, which were fine-grained, and you, know, you put an item of data at each processor, and perfectly synchronous and everybody had equal accent. In principle, it was really straightforward to program, okay? Um, and then we went on to say, well, what if you had a hypercube? Uh, at MIT, they built a connection machine and so on, right? Um, but the reality is a little messier. Uh, you have faulty and error-prone processes. Even if one processor you know, has a low probability of failure, one disk, by the time you build a data center with 100,000 of them, you're gonna have a few fail every few minutes, okay? Uh, you have coarse grain synchrony. You have, you know, gigabytes at least of data per processor, not one datum. Okay, so locality starts to matter. And, and here's something that's underappreciated: uh, the the cost of software development and maintenance in most of these situations far dominates the cost of any hardware savings you're looking for. Right? Um, and yet, you want to be able to solve at scale problems like which search queries co-occur, which friends to recommend, and so on. All the problems that we solve day to day. Okay, um, and so. The world as it used to exist you know, a dozen years ago was people tried parallel programming, multi-threaded. And those of you who've lived through this know that these are a pain to write, pain to read, and pain to debug, right? Um, and all of this has to run with more machines breaking in the back all the time, okay? So if you haven't seen MapReduce before, uh, this is going to be sort of the, the whirlwind tour of MapReduce in you know, 60 seconds. Uh, if you have, then this is going to be boring. So I hope for most of you this is boring. That's another thing I believe most undergraduates should go out with. They should go out with an understanding of MapReduce level, you know, Hadoop style uh, program. Okay. All right. So what it does is takes care of all the the housework for you essentially, right? So it takes you know tracks jobs, restarts things, uh, and it takes care of data distribution and resynchronization. Okay. But it only works for certain stylized forms of algorithms. And I'll show you a very stylized uh, form and a special example. Uh, and, and finish by saying how actually tweaking the algorithm a little bit addresses some of the consumer behavior challenges that I talked about earlier. Right? Now, I'm sure there are many people here who've been looking at more asynchronous ways of accomplishing the same thing at scale and so on. Uh, so this is not to say what I'm talking about here is state of the art and uh, you know, bright new future. All right, so, so you have all data represented as key value pairs. So for instance, a key could be an edge in a graph and a value might be its weight. Okay. And, and the way you, you have these you know, mapper and reducer libraries, so you write a mapper program that says describes your data and how you would want it to be key value. 
and, and the reducer. And these are the operations. And there are libraries running on your hardware that implement these things. So what does it do? It takes key value pairs. And essentially, you get to aggregate all data associated with the key. So all data associated with one edge of the graph or one node of the graph, for instance, right? One query in your search query log. Okay? And then the reduce uh, uh, operation basically take a list of such values associated with the key and then squeeze it in some form. And I'll give you an example in a moment. Okay? Typically, it's a counting operation or a, an ordering operation. Okay? Um, very roughly, you should think of this happening on thousands or tens of thousands of processes. Okay? The memory available is a few gigabytes per machine, even if your data set is terabyte set. So these are very rough parameters you should think about, right? So, so memory is not shared, all memory is local, and things produce in synchronous batches. Okay? So let me give you a very toy example uh, here. So you want to, you're given a graph, you want to count the number of triangles in it. Okay? Right, what do you do? This is sort of the obvious enumeration. Sequentially, how fast does this run? This is quadratic, uh, the sum of the squares of the degrees of the nodes. Okay? In practice, this is often quadratic. What do I mean in practice? Remember the heavy tail. So what happens in graphs we mostly deal with is there are a few nodes of very high degree, and there are enough of them that when you add this up, this ends up being quadratic. Okay? So this very naive algorithm is not good, but let's go ahead and, and do a map reduce version. So you generate all possible length two paths, okay, keyed by the middle node, okay, and that becomes your key in your key value pair. Check the completion of the triangle and then add up. Okay? And the way I've described it, you'll get three times the right answer. Okay? And so you can get the right answer. All right, what happens now is the running time, instead of becoming the sum of the squares of the degrees, becomes a max because what's happening is in the reduction phase, you have these reducers that are squeezing down, and the largest reducer gets a load that's this big. Okay, it's like dv squared. And so when you run this as a MapReduce program, what you're doing is most of your reducers are finished very early, and then the last few reduce are taking forever and forever and forever, right? Uh, so the high degree nodes, so just to give you an idea, right, uh, a node that has you know, 3 million neighbors, you'll have 10 trillion potential third edges to check. And even if you're doing 100 million of them a second, right, that's taking your day to finish this job. Okay? And so this is the curse of the last reducer, as it's called. Okay? Now, uh, and this, this is something that actually arises in consumer data for exactly the reason of the fat tail that I talked about earlier. Okay? A trivial modification of this algorithm turns out to fix this. And my point is not to enshrine this trivial modification as some dazzling insight, but really to get you to think again about distributions that arise in practice and why, when you do that, it makes you rethink your algorithm differently. Right? So all you do is you, exactly the same as before, but you count triangles instead of from the perspective of all three nodes in a triangle, from the perspective only of the lowest degree node in a triangle. Okay? And that's what this is. So why does it help? Okay. So let's say you partition the nodes in your graph into two groups, okay, where M is the number of edges. You look at the low degree nodes and the high degree nodes. Okay. Now first, there are very few high degree nodes. Okay. And so if you look only at paths to other high nodes, there are only so many different paths, right? Maximum from the high. Okay. Now you can do a little more careful counting and show that the low degree nodes also contribute relatively so many paths total. Okay, so what about parallel runtime here? Okay. Um, what happens is the, no, the algorithm in some sense is automatically load balancing because every node generates at most big O of M paths to check. Okay, and so the reducers all take about the same time to finish. And so the fat tail phenomenon suddenly goes away because you've taken the burden of the fat tail counting away from the fat tail nodes okay, to the, the, the lighter nodes. Okay. And, and this gives you a dramatic improvement in run times. In this case, you, know, you get a couple of orders of magnitude. Okay. So, so that was a quick introduction to MapReduce. But in the process, sorry, it was so fast. But the, the point I wanted to make there is, as you're designing MapReduce algorithms, you have to think a bit about data distributions and these consumer behaviors. Right? Right. So I want to leave a few minutes for questions. So, uh, so here are some closing thoughts. Uh, so a growing share, and I would argue already the bulk of computing cycles are consumed 
in the service of making ordinary users happy. Okay? So their expectations are increasingly shaping the way we solve computational problems. Okay? Their behavior shapes the distributions we observe. Okay? Um, and, and I've already made some comments that uh, are perhaps heretical uh, in many computer science departments. I've certainly been told I'm wrong, and you, you should feel free to tell me this again. But it does recast the way we think about and teach algorithms. Okay. The, the other side of this coin, I think, is somewhat more optimistic. Um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for here to, to rethink the way we approach the social sciences. So if you look at the social sciences broadly as everything from microeconomics at the most mathematical end, all the way to behavioral psychology and all this Kahneman and Tversky kind of stuff, right? Uh, I would argue that at the end of microeconomics, we are getting pretty well connected to computer science already. There's conferences, workshops on mechanism design, on computational auction theory, and all of that stuff. So, but that's still uh, sort of the most rational end of human behavior. Okay? That fits well with computer science because there is a common language of mathematics that ties together, say, mechanism design and, and auctions with computational methods. Right? If you drift off into the, you know, the end of saying, well, people who drank coffee before the seminar tend to fall, fall asleep more often, those things tend to be based on interviewing 30 people that, you know, you can talk to them at length, have a lot of fun. Uh, and I think there's a whole middle ground that says, how do we combine the different forms of data we have from detailed ethnographic field studies all the way to the large data that you can observe here, right? So the, the comment I've made in the past when uh, trying to convince the softer social sciences to work with computer scientists is, look, you're going to go talk to 40 people and get a great deal of data that's wonderful. I can, in an hour, tell you where 40 million people click. I don't know why, I have no clue. But you can run experiments, you can run control groups and treatment groups, run randomized experiments, and interpolate these met uh, methods, and hopefully come up with a virtuous cycle where some of the theories that you've held for 200 years can actually be tested. And in turn, the observations we make can go back and inform new theories that you can create. Okay? So I, I think of this optimistically as a very bright future for the computational social sciences that are ahead of us. And it's in campuses like this that it's going to be born because um, uh, you, know, you don't need people advocating pluralism. Uh, Intrinsically, campuses tend to bring departments together and have them work together in the best case. Um, and uh, some of you are laughing. I, I know how it works. Uh, but, uh, but, but really, I think there's room for optimism here, uh, as opposed to having some guy like me come from industry and advocate pluralism, because that sounds like, well, I've got tired of doing computer science, so I'm going to go tell the sociologists what to do, which is silly, right? Um, all right, let me stop with that, and I'm happy to take questions. So you mentioned a few things that uh, you thought undergraduates should have when they, they come out of uh, computer science. So one of it was me. Ma what they shouldn't have? For no, no. <laughs> I was gonna, so machine learning you mentioned and map uh, reduce. And so what are, what are some other things that are high on your list? And not just computer science, but what else should they know outside so, of computer science? So uh, well, OK. Uh, I do think, uh, especially for undergraduates who are not necessarily going to go to grad school and do a PhD, but get into industry. There are two things I always wish that the scientists and engineers I hired uh, were, would do before they came in. The first is learn a bit more economics. Okay. Uh, and, and that may st seem like a strange thing, but it really helps a different way of thinking. When, you, when you're trained as a computer scientist, you think of you know, using resources as well, having a small memory footprint, you know, debuggability, all, all this stuff. Right? An economist thinks differently, and, and I've learned this uh, from many long arguments with economists, uh, people, academic colleagues. Uh, so that's one thing, right? Uh, for those of you students here, and you know, this is not, I don't have to tell Chris this, but if there were one thing you really, really, really should learn before you go out there into the wide world, it's, and, and you seldom learn in an engineering or CS curriculum, it's 
the ability to communicate, okay? And, uh, you know, be able to tell me your story before you tell me your solution to, you know, seven orders of magnitude down, right? Uh, and, and this is so hard. Uh, and, you know, the first few times you have a relatively junior engineer or scientist come and give a presentation, you say, you know, you're talking to the big box, you have 30 minutes. Yes, got it. I'm going to explain exactly what I did. Okay, how many slides do you have? 64. No. Okay, so then they cut it down, cut it down. Okay, I've got it down to 30 minutes. No, because the boss is always 10 minutes late. Okay. Does that mean I cut it down to 20 minutes? No, come in with your 30 minute story, but figure out how you're able to tell it in 20 minutes if you have to. In real time, adapt, right? Uh, and one day the boss is 25 minutes late, it's very apologetic but you have to squeeze your pitch down to five minutes. So you've got to be able to communicate at multiple levels and adapt in real time. And that's something that seems obvious, but most students who show up in industry don't recognize the importance of this. Of course, they recognize with good reason the power of their ideas, their ideas are great, but if you cannot tell your story, uh, the world will unfortunately lose the benefit of your ideas, right? So uh, I know those are not quite the technical answers you were looking for, but I think they're important. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so it is, I think oh, absolutely. <laughs> right, right. So, so I don't think the design of algorithms is a class that should be short or uh, is a skill that can be forgotten. Absolutely not. We don't want to use machine learning to devise sorting algorithms. Okay, uh, we absolutely cannot. So, there's still lots of hard problems, uh, and you know. It's, it's certainly the case that if you look at math programming at large, there's still a lot of algorithmic work that needs to be done and will be used as a piece in many other cases. So algorithm design, maybe the way to look at it is when I say most algorithms are now designed by machines, the, 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 the sort of higher level abstraction like rec, you know, recognizing faces or whatever it is, right, beautiful sunsets, that is designed by machine. But down below, it's making uh, recourse to lots of human designed algorithms that had to be done really well by humans. Right. And doing those badly would be a shame. Yeah, I, I don't mean that we should abandon your CS whatever. Yeah. Comic. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we do. Uh, okay. So the sh very short answer is uh, we keep trying to get better at this. Uh, slightly longer answer is there is a fairly well understood both within companies like Google and more broadly across the industry, hierarchy of query needs, just like as you have the Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? So, so some of you know that 
at the top level, people think of three broad ca categories of queries, uh, three big broad categories. One so-called navigation queries where you type Delta Airlines and the only thing you want is the Delta Airline homepage. The second is informational where you say leukemia and you want to learn broadly about the topic and you want authoritative sources. And the third is so-called transactional queries where you say Nikon, whatever, and you get to buy it, right? So, so these are sort of three big buckets. Um, so it is true that we have to get better and we're trying to get more context into queries as well as documents, that this is a commercial intent, this based on the trail of the user. They're in the midst of purchasing a camera, et cetera. The flip side, uh, and we struggle with this a lot uh, because what we put out there is perhaps a little more limited than what we could put out there in some areas, is we have to make sure we don't get too good at it and become creepy. Okay. Uh, and, and this is a delicate balance. Uh, someone like yourself is a very educated consumer. Uh, you didn't tell me, hey, why didn't I get this result? You, you had 50% of the analysis of why, right? So you're an extremely erudite consumer. The normal person could get upset with some of the things they see. So we have to sort of throttle what we do sometimes. Yeah. Well, so, so I think there have historically been, I would say, two broad channels. And the, the first is, I absolutely think it's great for students to spend summers or breaks or whatever as interns in, in companies. It doesn't have to be Google, it's wherever. Right? I, I think it really gives them, I find that all the interns I talk to uh, who spend time go back with a very different view after their internship. Of course, you know, they need both sides of it. It's not like uh, and you know, the glib way I used to say this is computer science departments turn out computer scientists, industries want uh, developers, okay, and the two are not the same, right? And so you've got to get a bit of each ground. So that's one broad channel, right? The other channel I think is what many big companies do, which is provide research grants and you know, faculty programs, faculty summits, and so on, which is a way for industry to say, hey, here's where our attention is. And maybe you could start thinking about some of these issues because there is no pretense in any company that we'll hire all, hire all the smart people in the world. We do expect a lot of them to remain in academia and do good work. Yeah. All right, so, so without getting into gory detail, I will say that uh, a lot of what the data shows ends up being things you look at and go, oh yeah, that makes sense, okay? That's most of it, okay? If you, in terms of some of the things you talk about, which are careful conditioning experiments, right? Uh, it's much harder to find those. Uh, so it's not like they don't exist, you will find a number, but the majority of what you'll mine from the data has a good reason, it's in the data. Right, uh, and you know the fact that uh, users who are frustrated shake their mouse. Okay, uh, you look at the data and say, okay, yeah, I understand why they shook their mouse. It's frustrated. It's something to do with the experiment. Right? Uh, so, so those are behaviors you can readily explain. Some that are longer running are harder to diagnose, um, and, and you cannot always do it. The, the other thing you have to understand is you, you may get the impression that sitting at a company, I get to see everything at everybody does, it's not true at all. Uh, we have enough lawyers surrounding us and preventing them. So, so I have people in my team who look, who have, who do work on query logs, who do work on geolocation of people, uh, but they have to sign in blood lots of things before they can get to the data. And merely as being in their management, I cannot look at that data, right? 
So, so a lot of the time, you, you have to describe exactly what you're going to do with the data and what you're looking for before you get the data. So in some sense, you have to write the paper before you get the results. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's a fair comment, right? Um, so, so the question again for those of you who couldn't hear is, if, if algorithm design needs to adapt to consumer behavior and distributions, right? Uh, what happens as consumer behavior and distribution evolve, right? Uh, the, the, the unfortunate quick answer is right now we are so far from doing a good job on even the basic problem that we're not at the point where we're adapting uh, continually. There are some very specific areas, like certain forms of hashing for uh, distributing data, will in fact adapt dynamically. Okay, but that's not with any sort of premeditated insight on what's happening. Right? Yeah, just essentially by being very random, you can do things. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think there's, there's a deep point being made here, right? So what if you abdicate uh, algorithm design to machine learning algorithms and you're coming up with some magic and you have no clue what you've learned or why the algorithm behaves as it does? Uh, we, and I have to believe peer companies, spend a lot of time in many of these situations uh, building a machine learned algorithm and then spending a lot of time with smart people staring at what it did and then trying to reverse engineer and get intuition on exactly what behavior drove that and then re-engineering an algorithm from scratch, okay? Uh, and, and there's certainly parts of my company and I assume other companies that take this as a methodology, not just leave it sort of blindly to the machine. Thank you.